uh, thank you to the audience to be persistent until the end of uh, this meeting, and we still have a great talk afterwards. Uh, I will focus a little bit on uh, some of the main aspects related uh, with uh, some of the guidelines that were produced by the, uh, by the ESC and some recent uh, uh, data also. On the, and I will be a little bit more than just prosthetic uh, heart valves and go into valve disease in, uh, uh, in pregnancy. These were the guidelines that uh, were uh, produced in 2011 by the ESC regarding cardiovascular disease during pregnancy, and there was a whole section dedicated to valvular heart disease, including prosthetic uh, heart valves. And uh, there is also an interesting paper that uh, was published uh, just uh, a few months ago, and that was uh, uh, headed by Karen Sliva, a colleague from uh, South Africa, that actually made a very nice uh, review on the management of valve disease in pregnancy, a global perspective, including some specific adaptation to uh, low income and middle income and high income countries, which might be interesting. I will not get into the details, but uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, perspective that I recommend. Well, uh, regarding the background of uh, uh, valve disease in, uh, or actually in terms of uh, pregnancy, what it means, uh, we know that in Europe, and this is data coming from Europe, 1% of pregnancies are complicated by heart disease. And uh, if we look at the overall death rates per million uh, maternities according with uh, the different uh, types of uh, conditions, cardiac disease represents one of the main uh, reasons for death rate in, uh, um, during pregnancy, and it still represents quite a significant load, and some of the other, uh, uh, the, the other conditions that can lead to uh, 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 little co complications also involve the cardiovascular system, such as preeclampsia in a way, and, uh, and VTE. Uh, if we look at the evolution of, mater of uh, maternal mortality from heart disease in the UK, it's actually quite, uh, uh, quite bad, the figure, and this has to do also with uh, uh, the increased number of pregnancies, uh, of course, but also the increased prevalence of the disease, which makes it, and also the complexity of some of uh, these uh, uh, disease processes that make it still an important uh, uh, condition that needs to be approached uh, uh, correctly. We see here different series coming from different parts of the world in terms of the etiology of cardiac disease in pregnancy. Uh, for the acquired disease, rheumatic still represents a, a very important uh, uh, component, particularly in some parts of, uh, uh, of the globe. We have also degenerative disease, congenital uh, uh, valvular heart disease, and uh, we can see overall the mortality and morbidity related uh, with these conditions. If we look at the hemodynamic changes that occur during pregnancy, they can actually uh, explain a little bit why, for instance, aortic or mitral regurgitation, so meaning uh, uh, volume-loaded uh, uh, overload conditions are better tolerated during pregnancy than stenosis, like mitral stenosis or aortic stenosis, and, uh, and also that can condition a little bit the strategy that should be followed in these patients. Well, basically, there is an increase in the blood volume uh, about 50% uh, uh, during pregnancy. There's an increase in the cardiac output by 30, 50%, and the maximum of the increase is between the fifth and the eighth month of uh, pregnancy. There is usually a decrease in systolic and diastolic blood pressure and a decrease in the, syst in the systemic arterial resistance due to different factors, hormonal factors, placenta, and so on. Uh, if you look at, the, uh, at the, the changes that occur hemodynamically during delivery, during labor and postpartum, they can also explain why some of the main complications or some of the main symptoms occur during this period, particularly during the labor period, because there is an increase in oxygen consumption, there is an increase in the baseline cardiac output, as well as uh, uh, blood pressure during the, uh, the uterine contractions, which again, uh, it will be depending on the modalities of uh, delivery, the type of uh, 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 anesthetic that is used, the fact that it's a C-section or normal labor and so on. Uh, and in the postpartum, there is a, a shift of uh, blood from the placenta and, there is, and therefore there is an increase in preload and cardiac output which is also observed in the immediate postpartum period. Now, regarding cardiovascular diagnosis, uh, and particularly for the, this is overall, but particularly for the patient with heart valve disease, it's important, of course, the clinical assessment, and then some imaging modalities that should be radiation-free, like ECG, echo, and uh, magnetic resonance. And uh, uh, it can actually be, in certain instances, also used 
uh, exercise testing, particularly in the setting of some conditions that it might prove to be uh, important for diagnostic purposes. Here, it shows that it's important, particularly if it's a, a planned pregnancy and if there is vulvar heart disease already known in, in the patient, the planning is very important as in many other clinical conditions and these are the recommendations for preconception, evaluation and planning of the patient with heart, disease, with, with heart valve disease. Uh, a careful history, the, the ECG, echo, should be considered an exercise test to consider the assessment, uh, to have a better objective assessment of uh, functional classification and, of course, a careful counseling which uh, should be done with the patient regarding all the risks involved uh, with pregnancy, particularly in some specific types of, uh, of valve disease. Uh, complications uh, uh, related uh, with uh, pregnancy, infective uh, endocarditis, the same measures as in the non-pregnant patient should apply. The endocarditis uh, prophylaxis is now only recommended according with the ESC guidelines in patients who are at the highest risk to acquire endocarditis and with the highest risk procedures. And the antibiotic prophylaxis now is not recommended as a routine during uh, uh, both the, the vaginal or the C-section. It's considered as a 3C uh, indication. Now, in terms of the uh, timing and the, uh, the mode of delivery, uh, the, the favor spontaneous onset of labor and the normal delivery in most cases of stable heart disease, but in some other cases, and here we have the indications for the C-section, and in one of them is when there is severe aortic stenosis, uh, which uh, is a two-way indication, so it, it should be considered a C-section in this set of patients. And again, this is the typical example of multidisciplinary care for the high-risk patients. For the risk stratification uh, of the patients with uh, uh, cardiac disease uh, during pregnancy, there are different classification uh, systems. We we'll look into a couple of them, like the CARPREC uh, system, which basically look at the predictors of maternal cardiovascular events and sort of a risk score, and this risk score according with the points that either prior cardiac event, the baseline New York Heart Association functional class, presence of left heart obstruction, or reduced systemic ventricular systolic function. You get one point for each one of these, and the, the more points you get, of course, the higher the risk score and the risk estimation of, cardi of cardiovascular material complications if you get any of these uh, that are in this uh, scoring system. The, uh, these uh, are considered as high-risk states with contraindications for pregnancy, and of course, this needs to be discussed when there is a, a, an intention for a planned uh, pregnancy, and it includes not only the classical pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension or when there is severe ventricular dysfunction or previous peripartum cardiomyopathy, if there is severe mitral stenosis or severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, this should be very very, very well discussed with the patient. And of course, these things can be planned ahead and uh, uh, even the treatment can be discussed beforehand and before uh, the uh, pregnancy. So when we talk about stenotic and regurgitant valve disease, they have different clinical implications. The stenotic valve disease, there is a higher And that's why, as we uh, discuss a little bit, we can consider intervention during pregnancy if there is a, a, a persistence of uh, the symptoms. And, the, and this is possible, and there are quite a few series, and I know here you have a lot of experience in this specific area. Or if there is symptomatic aortic stenosis, because here there is a, a high risk of hemodynamic decompensation of these patients. The intervention uh, is... Uh, and that's why planning is so important here because in many of these cases the intervention should be done before pregnancy because of all the potential complications that may occur uh, during the course of pregnancy. Regarding regurgitant valve disease, here is a little bit less complex. Uh, there is usually good prognosis, particularly if there is preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. So in most of the cases, we can go uh, uh, through uh, with, the, with the pregnancy with only medical therapy, and actually surgery should be avoided and, uh, and should be planned uh, afterwards. We discussed a little bit about uh, anticoagulation. Uh, the oral anticoagulation with the vitamin K antagonist, despite some of the potential risks, are the safest uh, therapy to prevent valve thrombosis, and they should be the therapy of choice during the second and the third trimester. And during the first one, the continuation of oral anticoagulation should be considered if the dosage that the patient 
keeps the INR uh, 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 targeted uh, is less than 5 uh, uh, milligrams. Otherwise, it could be considered to switch to unfraction or low molecular weight uh, uh, heparin. And then after the 36 week, oral anticoagulations will be discontinued and replaced by those adjusted uh, heparin. And this is again a 1C indication. And basically here, we have now the recommendations for the management of the different conditions. For mitral stenosis, these are all one class one uh, indications. And again, if the patient is symptomatic, in some cases you have to do uh, and even consider balloon valvuloplasty if that's the case in the, uh, during the uh, pregnancy. If there is aortic stenosis, patients uh, with uh, severe aortic stenosis preferentially should be treated uh, before, and that's why planning is uh, so important. But uh, in some cases, uh, the, you, have, you may have to consider if there is significant hemodynamic decompensation during the uh, pregnancy. Because of lesions, we've already seen, they should be treated uh, afterwards, and normally, if there is preserved ejection fraction, you can uh, basically treat these patients uh, uh, during uh, uh, pregnancy with medical treatment uh, only. These are the recommendations for anticoagulation that we've, uh, uh, we've just discussed. And again, it's, uh, it's very important that uh, uh, if you, you can get the target INR with less than 5 milligrams, you can actually continue to use oral anticoagulation in these patients. Otherwise, you may have to shift into uh, infraction heparin or low molecular heparin. There are uh, still major gaps in evidence in, this, uh, uh, in these patients. One of them regards valve thrombosis and venous thrombosis. Uh, we don't have really good uh, randomized studies. They are not easy, that's true on anticoagulation strategies. And as we've seen, there is some controversy, although in most cases, the recommendations are to, add, particularly if there is a prosthetic valve, uh, to uh, add aspirin to, this, uh, uh, to these patients. But we still don't have very good evidence. We saw a couple of uh, uh, trials with the relatively small populations. There is no big randomized trial or significant trial to demonstrate the, or to support the evidence to make a clear recommendation. So in conclusion, regarding uh, uh, valve disease and uh, uh, pregnancy, cardiovascular diseases are still the most frequent causes of maternal death in uh, industrialized countries, and this is important to keep in mind. The uh, heterogeneity of heart diseases and inherent risks uh, 